So before, before I go, I'm going to ask a really stupid question. I like asking really stupid I've made my life asking really stupid <laughs> questions. How many people in the audience voted in the last governmental election? It doesn't matter what it was. How many of you exercised your right to vote? How many of you did not exercise your right to vote? Okay, why did you exercise your right to vote? I mean, politicians know more about politics than you, right? <coughs> I mean, okay, it's your tax money, but you don't really know how to spend your tax money, right? So, do you agree with me? No? You think you have a right to vote? Yes? Yes? Come on, yes, no? You have a right to vote? Yes? Do you have a right to say to the politicians how they can spend your tax money? Yes? Okay, for sure. All right, for sure, yes? For sure. So while we're talking here, no, I'm not talking to the financial guy, I'm talking to you as citizens and as NGO activists. Because this is a call to you to rally other citizens. So here is a question. Why is it that we think we have a right to vote? We have a right to tell government how to spend our money when we pay in taxes. But actually, we think we do not have a right to vote in the investments we have and tell the companies we own how to spend our money and how to shape our society with our assets. Isn't that crazy? Yes, yes. no? Yes. 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 Exactly. And that's the subject of this talk. And I'm going to tell you something else. But before we go there, I'm going to share some numbers with you. Now, we all hear about the SDGs, right? We all believe in them. Yes, yes, no, yes. yes. Okay. How much do we need? How much do we need? Three billion a year, is that the figure? Catherine, you know the numbers better. Is it three billion a year we need? 30 trillion. 30 trillion. Yeah. Wow, that's a lot, isn't it? Isn't that a lot? Yes. Yes? Do you know how big the savings pool in the world is? 71 trillion. Who owns it? We do. We do. Sorry, what's the problem? <laughs> So this talk is a little bit about that problem. And the problem is that over the last two to three hundred years, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm a historian, so I like, I'm not really a financial guy, I never studied economics, I just studied history. <laughs> so I like looking at history because history is really, really exciting and tells you things. And history can be really surprising. I'm going to go completely on a tangent and do something Catherine told me not to do. I'm going to mention Brexit. So no, no wait, wait. I'm an immigrant, right? So I'm kind of neutral. I'm completely neutral. I'm an immigrant to the whole of Europe. <laughs> Let alone to my country, the UK. But one of the most exciting things about history, in my view, is the development of DNA history, which is we can trace humanity as we come out of Africa, and apologies for American creationists. We, we can trace our history as we come out of Africa as a small band of maybe 200 people and then spread across the world. And actually, it changed a lot of what we think of as human history. So here is my take on Brexit in one second before I go to this. And it's actually relevant because it's a different way of looking at it. I live in a country, and I'm very proud of living in it, where we have a German monarch, where we used to have an aristocracy that was Franco-Danish, where the majority of the population is either Danish or German, and there's a remnant of the indigenous population which it turns out came from Syria. I mean, <laughs> so what's the problem? The problem is, the problem is, we don't spend enough time analyzing what we think is truth. That's the problem. And we take stuff given to us by experts, and we never ask if these experts actually are experts, and whether they really, really understand what they're doing, and we accept their expertise, and nowhere is this more pernicious, more dangerous than in finance. Because what's happened is, I listened to the conversation, and by the way, the pre, the pre lunch speech, ace, absolutely ace. I support everything being said at, on, on board. But, but the problem with the discussion we all have, we all have this discussion as if there are two worlds out here, right? There's kind of like the financial worlds, and there are baddies and goodies in the financial world, Goldman Sachs, ooh. <laughs> <laughs> but do you know what I mean, right? You know, Hermes, hey. <laughs> it's not true. It's not true. Right? It's not true. But we also think that we can affect our part of the world, which is politics, 
We can do so through civil society, because we know how to use civil society. We can do so through voting, because we know and we have views about it. But we all think that we can't affect this other thing called finance. And yet this other thing called finance actually controls us. We live in a society where the companies in whose shares we own shape, whether we hit two degree warming or not, is going to be influenced by major companies. Who owns them? We do. We live in a society in which the working practices of these companies, whether they're actually fair from gender diversity or ethnic diversity background or not, is influenced by them. Who controls them? We do. We live in a society in which the way we treat people further down the chain, when we talk about SDGs, the companies that we own rely and work with companies in developing countries, and they can dictate what rights to give their workers. We control it. And we take our responsibility as citizens very seriously. If I were to have a one-on-one -on -one discussion with you about any political topic, not just Brexit, each and every one of you would have very strong views, and you tell me exactly what you think. And you'd go out and you'd vote for the person you believe in. But when it comes to finance, you sort of accept that really, because I'm a financial guy, I know more than you do. And what I'm going to try to explain in the next 25 minutes is actually the financial guys and the guys in the economy have got it completely wrong. And that there is actually a different way of looking at things. And then it becomes your duty, mine too, as a citizen. That's why I'm not here as a service. I'm here as a citizen. It becomes our duty collectively to change how people look at truths and what the experts are telling us and to question them, because there's a lot to question. I like asking why. Why is an important question. You know, most people ask how, not why. And a while back, I went to the philosophy lecture. That sounds like I'm really sophisticated. It's not true. It was my daughter had a philosophy society, and she brought in this philosophy to speak to these high school kids, and I just went to listen. And the philosopher said, you know, the world is divided into scientists who ask how, essentially, and philosophers who ask why. And what's happened in modern society is we ask a lot of how questions, and we stop asking the why question. And because we stop asking the why question, we stop understanding why the system failed. So why are we here today? Because you care about the system. Why do you care about the system? Because it's failed. The question is, why did it I'm going to take a much wider view of why it failed. And hopefully with that, and armed with that, you can go out and go to see experts from Gordon Sachs or any other firm, or Barclays or Hermes, whatever you want, and tell us that we're wrong. Because you'll understand that the system is richer and deeper and more powerful. It's just, it's been manipulated by misunderstanding. And actually, it's based on misunderstanding of facts. I promise you. Like I said, I'm a historian. I like telling stories. Here's the story. See, economics starts with the guy, or modern economics, on the extreme right. Of course, economics starts like 3,000 years ago. But it starts with the guy on the extreme right, Adam Smith. Now, everybody in my business will say to you, oh, you know, we read Adam Smith's book because this is about you know, how free markets work. It's not true, by the way. Most of them haven't bothered reading it. <laughs> but some of them have because they've gone to university and the one on economics is dedicated for a week. But actually, Adam Smith wrote two books. One was about markets, and one was about moral philosophy. And the one about markets came after the one about the moral philosophy and was based on it. He was assuming a kind of society in which actually people had a moral obligation. He wasn't assuming a free-for-all. I'm not saying I agree with everything he said, but I'm saying people have misunderstood him. But from that was born this great idea that people in my business and in banking, and by the way, in government, because they believe the bankers, and in finance, to forward, which is that economics was this amazing thing, scientific thing, not yet scientific, but this amazing thing that will forge forward and create the new society. Because, you know, from the 19th century and the European Renaissance and the Industrial Revolution, we are entering new territory. And by the way, they've forgotten, like I said, we've been doing economics ever since we left Africa. So, the next slide is interesting because nobody listened to it. Uh, it's not just because he's French, the one of them. <laughs> Nobody listened to him because he was very sensible. He, was, he doesn't smile, maybe that's why. But Bastiat was a, a, a visionary. And he wrote one pamphlet, but that one pamphlet actually has the answer to the problems we have today. 
In simple language, he said, it's not as simple when you're making economic decisions about how do I make profit and how do I make loss. There are unseen costs and unseen profits which matter. He called, he had an example he gave as a window pane. He said that the, the cost of a broken window pane have heard or read as you read the papers about the finance, some talk of equilibrium, economic equilibrium. Hands up, hands up, yeah. How many of you have read that equilibrium is a good thing? Hands up, yeah. Do you know why economists say that equilibrium is a good thing? Because in the 1880, physicists were absolutely obsessed with the idea of equilibrium. And they said equilibrium is a good thing. In modern day physics, equilibrium means death. <laughs> but science has kind of went on. And then from Walbrow went to Alfred Marshall and modern neoclassical economics went on. But through it all was this idea that economics was a self-contained model that was scientific, that had laws, laws exactly like physics. And by the way, it excluded us. It excluded the citizens who have a will. It excludes us as humans, because it assumes something which is bizarre. It assumes that everything that we do is entirely based on rationality. How many of you, actually I'm scared of asking this question, <laughs> how many of you who own a car, even if it's an electric car like me, how many of you who own a car chose it entirely on a spreadsheet that tells you the cost return effect over a 10 year horizon when you bought it? <laughs> That's a rational thing to do. There's no other reason you should actually buy a car, right? How many of you chose it because it looked good and the color was nice? <laughs> yeah. See, economic modeling doesn't allow that. And yet, a whole system is designed on a modeling that assumes actually we are going to buy a car because we have a spreadsheet and we look at the cost of the return of the horizon and the scale of the present. Do you see a problem here? And the result of going down this path is over the last 200 years, we, and by the way, I don't exclude us from the blame. We as citizens, because we are complicit, because we allowed it to happen with our money. We built a monster, right? We built a monster. We built a financial system that has zero to do with the real world in which we live in. Zero. I'll give you an example. By the way, if you want footnotes, and for people who actually want to look at this seriously, the paper is published on the 300 website. It's called The Why Question. And it is for the limited. But I'm kind of trying to make it slightly more fun than a boring academic paper. So here is an, here's an example of why it looks completely stupid. In theory, the amount of foreign exchange that we do should be equivalent to the amount of purchases and sales and imports and exports that we do as different nations around the world. Right? There's no other reason to buy and sell currency. I want to sell a card to Europe, or I want to buy a card from Europe, I buy euros, I want to buy a card from Mr. <coughs> I buy dollars, and so on. Right? And yet, if you look at the chart on the left hand, I'm dyslexic, on the left hand side of the screen, you will know that the forex market is several hundred times bigger, actually, it's more than a thousand times bigger, than the amount of trade. So, hang on a minute. Foreign exchange should be about trade, surely. But we've created the market that's just, just there to trade money? To do what? Make money for the people trading it? Why? Sorry, why? I mean, it serves no purpose, right? And it's not the only one. How many times do you hear people say, investment in capital markets is about allocating capital? That sounds really important, you know. We allocate capital. I actually heard an economist who I really, really suspect say that to me uh, less than a month ago. It's complete baloney. <laughs> it used to allocate capital around about 1890 and 1900 when companies were young. But most of the companies on the stock market do not raise capital from actually savers. All the trading on the stock market is simply me as, a, as an investor, trading with Alex as an investor, and then trading with somebody else as an investor. We're just passing a piece of paper around. Professor gave a study in which he said, if you look dispassionately about the rights of ownership in companies, and he lists seven or eight rights of ownership, technically speaking, the only people exercising the rights of ownership are the C-suite. The shareholders are not. And that 
disgrace. So when we complain about our society, let's talk about our own countries, not being fair. When we complain about them misusing and charging high prices, when we complain about high fees going to people who haven't added value, sorry, we are the show. And there's this amazing dichotomy we've created where we differentiate between shareholders, something over here, and citizens. I've got news for you. The citizens are the shareholders. Mm -hmm. It's just we are collectively the shareholders of the system. And we have collectively not bothered to actually look after our shareholders. We talk about responsibility, and this is about responsible investment. We have a responsibility, a moral responsibility, for stuff we own. And I'm not afraid of controversy. Like, for example, the sports track has been accused of in the UK. I am responsible for it. Sorry. I cannot say I have poor slavery and I own shares in it. I have a right. And if I own it through a fund manager or through a pension scheme, I have every right and moral duty to go to that pension or my industry and say, I don't want to own that because I don't believe in slavery. If I want to complain about my daughters not being given a fair chance because there is bias in society, Towards people. So what are we complaining about? I own the companies, right? You own the companies, we can change it. And I come from the developing world. If I'm going to complain about how we treat people in the developing world, sorry, we own the companies that buy stuff from them. And that's what we've given up. Now, what people tell you, actually, talk about this, this is an interesting one. What people tell you is all that is well and good. But, but they say, that is just idealism. That is just Sacker, who was once accused of being a hippie and a tree hugger, and it's true, I used to play guitar. It's a kid. He's just an idealist. Right? He's just an idealist. The real hard facts are that the, the fiduciary duty, Alex said it, the fiduciary duty of pension schemes is to maximize return. You give 100 euros, and when you retire, you want to get back 200 euros, or whatever the number is. And then the only duty that pension schemes have towards you is to pay you. Five, ten euros a year until you die. And so we are then stuck on the outside of the system and say, okay, we want to do the SDGs, we want responsible investment, how do we play around the periphery? Right? Because we give in to this idea that the point is to maximize return. And by the way, we say, that thing about investing in money is really complicated. It's really, you need real experts to do it. Right? You need really, real experts to do it. Here is the news. If the point of investing for the future, if the point of the 70 trillion is actually to increase returns, and we are truly rational human beings, not emotive human beings, then we should be investing in poker players. Do you think I'm joking? Yeah? You think I'm joking? Yes? Yes? I'm not joking. Whoops, I just turned it off. Somebody turned it on again, and then I'll turn it on again. I will carry on while we um, try to fix it. Yeah. Poker players have a better chance statistically of making you money than investments. Statistically true. Statistically true. So if you say to me the point of investing in pension schemes is to be, is to beat the market and to win, it is not that that doesn't make sense. If that's the point, go to Las Vegas. Hire a professional poker player or buy a poker bot and put your money with them because they win more than the best skilled players in the investment markets. And therefore, I think that there's another reason why we invest. And the reason that we have to invest is nothing to do with traditional economic and financial theory because traditional economic and financial theory is not science. The difference between economics and financial theory is the laws of, uh, sorry, the difference between physics and financial theory is that the laws of physics are by and large immutable. And by the way, if you want to have a discussion about the difference between macrophysics and, and by the time you go to quantum physics, let's have it. But by and large, by and large, the understanding of gravity and Newtonian physics works pretty much, whether you believe it's such a way of doing it or not, it, anywhere. And the reason that you're happy to get into a piece of metal and fly I mean, think about it. The reason that you entrust yourself to that is because you know that it doesn't matter when you fly, where you fly, there are no externalities. The laws of physics have no externalities. They just work. 
The laws of economics are entirely built on externalities. Now, if I'm going home this evening, and you think I'm going to step onto a piece of metal with two wings on it, and I'm being told that, by the way, as you go down the runway, you're going to have one externality after the other affecting the airlift of that. I'm not going to fly. I'm going to walk and take a boat. And so would you. So let's take it down to a level of what it makes more sense to you and where it actually ties into what this meeting is about. People in our business will say to you, it's a straightforward formula. Like I said, all that you've heard from Saki so far is just kind of nice, tree-hugging stuff that is not real economics. Because real economics is about profit. And the way you calculate profit, you get a buy price, a sell price, you take one from the other, Voila, you have profit. And by the way, you then have people say that real, to make really big profit, you have to wait for 10 years or 15 years. And some people say, I'm really smart, I can do it in one or two or three months. And I'm, with all due respect for the long term, so I have nothing but deep love for the both. They're miscalculating the profit, actually. See, because capital markets are fueled by our money, tertiary, Secondary and tertiary effects do have an effect because it affects us in a bigger way. So let me go off this and just very simply talk about 2008. Why has Europe suffered from seven years? It suffered from seven years because of what? Because the banks made mistakes. It doesn't matter why, how, but that's the right thing. Let me take the UK as an example. The investors in the UK stock market up to 2006, seven, thought they made a huge amount of money. Specifically, they made a huge amount of money by investing in worldwide investment banks. It looked like a great investment. You then had the crash in 2008, and you had a recovery since 2008, and we're more or less back to the same level. So most investors, professionals, would say to you, as pension investors, we're back to the starting point. So it's okay. In the long term, we're fine, bad banks, We'll punish them, but actually it's okay we've solved the problem. We haven't. The cost of the UK economy on the crash was one trillion. It wasn't the direct cost of the share price going down, it was an indirect cost of the effect of what the banks did on society. And the fact is that we in Europe, we in the UK, we in Europe have to pay for it. Catherine and I, each share, roughly. 26,000 pounds of additional debt through our government debt that we would not have as citizens if the banks had not done what they'd done. And by the way, we owned the shares. It was, it was our property that caused that crash. If I have a wall and the wall falls on the garden of my neighbor and, and God forbid harms his child, I'm liable, right? We owned the shares collectively. The us collectively. And we're still paying the price collectively. Eight years of corruption in the market, the huge amount of debt we've seen, the catastrophe in Greece, that's all secondary and tertiary effect. The question about global warming is not a question about, of, oh, how can we influence the companies? Sorry, the direct effect of owning certain companies or not owning certain companies, the direct effect of not engaging and engaging powerfully with companies is this spot will be underwater in about 60 years unless we do something about it. And that's a cost. And when you calculate the cost of your pension scheme, it's not enough to say, I have, I don't know, I could have walked away with 200 euros. Oh, wow, very good. I now have 210 euros. What good is 210 euros if your house is underwater? I mean, I'm not being funny. Seriously. Seriously. So this is not about us working on the periphery to try to influence people to change things. This is about taking a call to go to the main financial system and say to them, you've got it wrong. Because every action you take with our money, every action the companies we own through you take, affect the society we live in. And if they make the wrong decisions, that will come back to us. And if we want to calculate the profit and loss account, then environmental costs are not a theoretical thing that will happen. It's a real thing and deducted from the return. So for every pension scheme that's telling you it has returned X for you so far, say, really? So let's deduct several trillion pounds or euros worth, which is what the, Euro, which, what is, what the GFC has cost us. 
because that's the true return. And then tell me, sorry, how much are you charging me for this? Not, not just the fund managers, but the guys running the pension schemes. And by the way, the government too. So what have you done about it? You're telling us that we have to have, at least in the UK, seven years of austerity because of what? Because you stop people from making major mistakes. I mean, if you stop them, we wouldn't be here. And the real truth is, we can work on the periphery, but the listed companies have the most power. I'm not going to mention the names, you know the names. They have the most power. They shape the society as we live And unless we do something with them, actually the society we live in is not going to progress to where we want to. And the first thing we've got to do is tell everybody in the financial system that when you calculate cost, you have to think about holistic cost, total cost. And when they argue, you say to them, go back and read a perfectly acceptable economist called Bastian. And he talked about secondary and tertiary costs. And when you calculate your profit and loss, don't take just the sell and the buy. Take the secondary effect of what you've done. Because you, a citizen, are paying the cost. The reason that Europe has been in that time is precisely because of what the stock market did. And who did it? We did. Did we deduct that? No, we did not. Because we don't think about it. Then you won't So I will go on and tell you about them. Um, oh, no, yeah. Before I go to this, let me, um, let me give you another example. Let me give you another example, I'll just to give you this for a second. There's a discussion, uh, I was looking at the FT today, and bear in mind is that everybody in this business, politicians also, understand large numbers. There's something that they call the law of large numbers. Everybody understands large numbers. People talk in billions. We, we like working in billions. Yeah. We manage 30 billion. It's 300 billion. But actually, citizens deal in small numbers. If the average pension scheme for somebody who is lucky in Europe, or in Australia, or in the United States, when they retire, is going to be a sum of money somewhere between the region of 300 to 500,000 euros. These are the lucky people. That will generate an income somewhere in the region of 15. 13 to 15, maybe 17,000 euros a year. If by buying companies that burn more fossil fuels, ignore environmental concerns, mistreat their workers, do all these things, if by doing all of that the share price goes enough that the pot increases by 10%, which sounds a huge amount, that will only translate for the single pensioner when she retires of something like 90 euros a month. The 90 euros a month is not going to compensate for the higher health costs, the higher food costs, or indeed the higher environmental costs. I even haven't gone into the argument of there's a concord between us and our children that we should hand them an economy that works and an environment we want to live in. I'm not even going, I'm saying on pure metrics of profit and loss, we're looking at the wrong metrics. So this is just saying that actually companies that do ESG are before, which is kind of that's for you guys, you take that stuff, right? But, but here is the message I'm going to leave with you, and I'm going to finish this up for half an hour. The message is go out and actually spread the word and put pressure. And the word you should spread is the following. Say to the financial industry, you're miscalculating the profit and loss. Because the loss or the profit has to take into account the effects that the companies that you own have on our society. And the financial crisis is a big example of and we should use the financial crisis as an example to push for change in the environment. Because what we can say to them is, look at how massive it is. It's only this year that Europe is coming out of a crisis. And that's nothing compared to the environmental crisis coming if we don't do something about global warming. And we can control it not just through government activity, but actually through us as citizens controlling our savings. And go out and tell the experts that they got the maths for, and to reassess their science of economics because it ain't the science. Adam Smith understood that economics was a political philosophy, political, because he understood this to do with what kind of society we want. I'll end with one last and slightly controversial example. Um, when I was doing my doctorate, I used to do um, health teaching the bad class of 8 in the morning because the professor doesn't want to turn off kind of thing. And the easiest, the easiest question was always given to first year 
people studying medieval history of us. And the barbarians never intended to destroy the Roman Empire, they just came to enjoy it. And there's a bit of truth in that. Europe is now facing a migration crisis, right? Chances of Merkel is still compassionately about it, everybody is still compassionately about it. Whatever your views about it doesn't really matter. We can all agree there is a cost inherent. There's a social cost and a physical cost, yes? We all agree. So if we invested in companies that invest in companies in North Africa and Africa that actually build infrastructure, provide employment and health, how many do you think still want to come in? And how much money would we actually save? And if we calculate on that matrix, how much profit are we making? Because there is a profit, right? But it's got to be a holistic profit. Thank you very much for listening.